Welcome to Dying in Grace, the program where all aspects of death and dying, end of life and wellness are discussed and stories are shared from the heart. My name is Arlene Steputat. Each week I like to bring somebody from our community to share with us a unique story or viewpoint about death and dying. Tonight, I'm very happy to welcome my guest, Jerry Roberts. Jerry is a, a journalist um, with a strong political point of view as his writing, and also the host of a TVSB program here himself called Newsmakers. That's exactly right. Right. So thank you so much uh, for being on the show and agreeing to um, share with us. Well, I, it's an honor for me to be here, uh, Arlene, I mean, knowing of your work and, and everything you do for the community and your writing and this you know show is just so important that death is just something that is not talked about it's you know we so often try to avoid talking about it and uh, to have a forum where really what you know we all share in common and uh, a lot of people are afraid to talk about it's just uh, terrific and, and, well, and thank, thank you. you for that well I appreciate it and uh, it is my um, and the, my personal mission to get us to normalize death and reintegrate it as part of the cycle of life. Uh, because it used to be that way before death became a medical event. We, we do know how to help each other die. We've been doing it for centuries. We've just uh, moved it away. And I kind of like to quote um, Woody Allen a lot. Uh, it's not that I'm afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Yeah, exactly. you know? and so. <laughs> I'm hoping that we are going to be there when our death happens, and my my goal is to have people die in presence and pain free and in loving. So, and it, it's interesting uh, that there have been several books in recent years that have been really big bestsellers. One of them written by a friend of mine, Katie Butler, who begins with how her father uh, got into the sort of the medical uh, industrial complex and really was not able to die, was kept alive, you know, kind of against his will. And I, and I think it's an issue that more and more people are thinking about because medical technology has advanced so much and can keep us alive uh, for a long time. What does that really mean? And, you know, at what point do we get to choose a quality of life or do we get to choose our own ex exit? Well, and, and that's a perfect segue, but I, I do want to say that um, this medicalization of end of life has a lot to do with government and, and you know the good news is hospice is a benefit a federal benefit of medicare people can take it uh, but it's so grossly misunderstood and um, you know part of that's why advanced care directives are so important and i think that um, there is a change happening you are seeing more stories and more uh, bestsellers. And my personal view is it's because of the baby boomers. This is called the silver tsunami. There's uh, every day 10,000 people turn 65. And so it's us. And as a boomer myself, we changed everything from building more kindergartners, kindergarten, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, women's lib, you name it, we've done it. And now it's our parents, our partners, ourselves and we're kind of like it's got to be done a different way and there's a groundswell of change so I do think I want to be part of changing that yeah uh, there is a groundswell but I think as with so many things today that the nation is kind of polarized about it as well I mean I think California is one of five or half dozen states that have an end-of-life option law all blue states um, uh, a lot of red states, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's never going to happen, never would happen. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm glad I'm we're in California really? for one thing. We're 75, 76 percent in the last poll I looked at. People believe that we should have an end of life uh, option act, that we should have uh, more control. Yes, and let's just... Um explain that for people who may not be familiar. You and I both are familiar with that term, but uh, that is a, a law. Um, some people call it a dig dignity, death with dignity. Uh, some people wrongly call it euthanasia or doctor-assisted suicide. It is none of those things. And so just so people know, there's very specific uh, guidelines for being able to acquire medication to 
end your own life when you're on hospice care and you have to see a doctor, you have to request it in writing, you have to see a second doctor that evaluates you, you acquire the medication, and most importantly, you have to be able to take it yourself. Mm -hmm. It cannot be administered by someone else. And you can also go through the process and get all the drugs and just keep them on the shelf and allow a natural death. And uh, when California put it into law, we did a lot of chatting with Washington and Oregon, which of course have had this law in for a long, long time. And there was a very high percentage of people that seek the drugs, want the choice, because their control, they want the control, but then a very high percentage don't execute it. Yeah, the comfort of having it. I, I, I brought along uh, Jerry Brown, Governor Brown's signing message of the bill, which was known formally as ABX215, because there was a special session that had been called about health care uh, at a time when uh, the state was adjusting Medicaid payments because of the Affordable Care Act, and this came up during that session. Um, and there were the infamous uh, death panels, right? That death was panels, part of it yeah. too. And, you know, it had been debated for a long time and really hadn't surfaced much in the legislature. And, and the key, I think, to the passage of it was that the California Medical Association went from opposed to neutral on it. But, you know, I, as I was saying before the show, you know, I, I've covered Brown for years, for decades, really. and. This signing statement was so profound to me, and I, I just wonder if I could just oh, read please, it. Oh, please, please. He says, to the members of the California State Assembly, ABX2 is not an ordinary bill because it deals with life and death. The crux of the matter is whether the state of California should continue to make it a crime for a dying person to end his life, no matter how great his pain or suffering. I have carefully read the thoughtful opposition materials presented by a number of doctors, religious leaders, and those who champion, champion disability rights. I have considered the theological and religious perspectives that any deliberate shortening of one's life is sinful. I have also read the letters of those who support the bill, including heartfelt pleas from Brittany Maynard. She was the, the person yes, who yes. became the face of it. And her, you know, her husband was here in town. Uh, also, he did a whole campaign yes. uh, at Congregation Brene Bith talking about it. Heartfelt pleas from Brittany Maynard's family and Arch Archbishop Desmond Tutu. In addition, I have discussed the matter with a Catholic bishop, two of my own doctors, and former classmates and friends who take varied, contradictory, and nuanced positions. In the end, I was left to reflect on what I would want in the face of my own death. I do not know what I would do if I were dying in prolonged and excruciating pain. I am certain, however, that it would be a comfort to be able to consider the options afforded by this bill, and I wouldn't deny that right to others." I mean, it's, that so perfectly sums up I think the crux of the matter, what it's about, and why it's important to give people the option, and why government should not be in the business of denying that option to people. And of course, you know, characteristically, Brown's talked to everybody on the planet about it. Uh, right, you know, right. From from every uh, religious, uh, philosophical, psychological, medical uh, perspective, um, and so. Uh, but in the end, it's so personal, which is so unlike him. I mean, he, he doesn't go into the personal very often. But ultimately, that's, that's what it's about. I mean, each of us is going to die alone. And I think he's put himself in that position and really made a, a very, very smart and well-informed decision on it. Well, I think there's two things that happen. It's either someone that puts himself in that position and thinks, what would I want, as he did, or as you mentioned, uh, Brittany Maynard's husband watching somebody bearing witness to someone being in that kind of pain, and you know her having to pick up and leave the state to get what it was that she wanted to make that choice. So uh, it's it's a very complex issue, and uh, having worked around hospices, I have known people that have made those choices. I've known people that have opted to use the drugs, and I also know people that have opted not to. Well, as you point out, and, and I think the, uh, the Department of Public Health State obviously has gathered statistics on how mm -hmm. it's been used, and uh, you know, don't hold me to these precise figures, but I think it's about 111 people actually use the drugs 
uh, but there were some 300 people who asked to have them. About 250 of those received them. So as you point out, large numbers of people have them there as an option, and I think that's why it's called the uh, the uh, 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 end of life option mm -hmm. act. And it and it, I think it is a great comfort. Well, I'm not a medical professional, but in talking to doctors and nurses that have worked in end of life for years. Uh, yes, this is an expedient way to do it, but people who have wanted to end their life in pain have always found different ways to do it, whether they're hoarding their, their meds. Um, there's a lot of people that do what's known in the field as VSED, voluntarily stop eating and drinking. And usually within eight days, eight to ten days, the body shuts down. And it's actually not a painful process. Uh, there is a whole video with a doctor doing that because mm. he wanted to end his life. But I think there is something about that conscious choice and being able to do it in... Nobody... I mean, I, I've heard of deaths that went peacefully in 30 minutes, and I know some that have uh, taken seven, eight, nine hours. Sure. But, but there is that um, ability to say, I call it quits now. Right, and, and I think the key, again, it, it, it shouldn't be a crime. The government should not be in, a business, in the business of making it a crime for someone to make decisions about their own end-of-life care. And, and, and to the end, what this law also does is ensure that insurance companies don't make it a crime. So that's one thing when we're doing the education for families that are considering this. Uh, if you have life insurance and you choose this end of life option act, it, it's not deemed a suicide, so your insurance doesn't get waived. Right, and then I, I think there was a um, follow-up bill, AB 282 or something, which also protects medical practitioners mm -hmm. from being uh, prosecuted uh, for following the protocols uh, that are uh, under the law, because we never know who's going to be in office Really, that's true. Ultimately, that's right. true. And and the other piece is, uh, as I know it in practice in hospices, um, in our local hospice medical, one of our local medical hospices here, uh, what's true is the doctors can choose to write the prescriptions or not. I'm aware of some doctors that said I'm not going to do that. Same thing with the nurses and any of the team. So you're not required in your job to go against a moral or an ethical issue, you know, that you particularly have. And what we do, what is required um, by policy is that if you, you are the medical practitioner administering or being present when the person takes the drug, because of course they can take it themselves, there needs to be someone else in the room that's not part of the medical, like a family member or a friend. Someone else has to bear witness so they don't go back and say, you killed my mother. Right. Which we, people say that to nurses all the time just because they gave them morphine. You know, there's yeah. all that kind of stuff. So um, you yourself, though, have had your own experiences, kind of life-threatening experiences with cancer. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about what that's like and how that shaped your own views. Um, well, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. I've had lymphoma, two different forms of lymphoma. Uh, the second time uh, was in 2012 um, before this law went into effect, and it was an extremely aggressive form of cancer. It's called double hit lymphoma. It spread very rapidly. Um, you know, I lost the use of my legs. I couldn't eat. I couldn't swallow. I had feeding tube. I was really sick. You had a feeding tube. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and it was a very aggressive chemotherapy treatment as well. So the combination of being really sick and being really sick for the treatment. Um, uh, my, my wife and I, when I was admitted to the hospital, you know, looked at the very few studies that were, had been done on, on this form of lymphoma. And the average life expectancy from diagnosis was four months. And when I was first admitted to the hospital, there was a doctor who needs work on bedside manner, but uh, uh, was kind of yelling at my wife, you know, there are no good outcomes, there are no good <laughs> outcomes, and I'm laying there whacked out on fentanyl, you know, hearing, hearing this. So, so it was difficult, but the suffering, the, which is a really a second by second by second experience that 
that one goes through um, really made me feel like you know I I wished that I had some option which really at that time there there wasn't mm -hmm. um, you know here I was being told you know you, you you have a very short time to live you know I'm suffering I'm in pain I you know I just wanted to, to call it quits my wife who's always gets her way you know insists that I, can, <laughs> I continue with the treatments but um, that that has shaped my my view and and really made me I think more of an advocate for this act than I usually you know I, I, I can usually keep a distance about policies and politics and kind of try to see various sides of it but this one to me is kind of a no-brainer but let me ask you this um, if I'm understanding you right, and I, I, I mean, thank you for sharing, and I can't imagine not only the physiological, you know, the pain of, of this from the treatment and from the disease, but also the emotional pain. I mean, really facing your own mortality, like this is, this is my life, and, and you're telling me I'm, this is what my life's going to be for the next four months, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so if I understand you accurately, you're, you're saying, you know, had that end of life option act come into existence, you might have. I certainly would have considered it, yes. And, and again, you know, what I find so powerful about it is the comfort that it affords to have that option. Mm -hmm. To have I, the control. Right, and going back to all the people who received the, the the drugs but but didn't use them but yet there is a comfort to that that I think eases your suffering somewhat because you do uh, you are able to uh, have a feeling of some more control in, in a situation where you know the illness aside the emotional aspects aside you know you're in this medical industrial complex which has its own rhythms and its own protocols and and once you're sucked into that you're you're in it when once you're in it you're in it as somebody famously said on the wire um, and so you're kind of trying to um, establish some agency within that context and so I think this is a way to give an individual um, properly uh, some greater control uh, over their life and how it's going to end. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting too because um, sometimes it's about pain, although often, I would say more often than not, pain at the end of life is usually fairly well managed for most cases. But the people I hear that want it are people that are uh, becoming physically debilitated for instance, an ALS patient, you know, where the idea of the quality of life and the uh, letting go of who you you once were and, and, and looking at who you are. And I, I know, um, I think of Tuesdays with Maury. Mm -hmm. And, and there, there, that gentleman didn't have that option. It would be interesting to see whether, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. But it, it's a really interesting place to look and I think that, that I, I know some people have said I, I don't want to have someone have to care for me. That's not dignity for me. So with Brittany Maynard as part of what her thing was was how much excruciating pain she was in and the yes. amount of seizures and that type of thing that could not be medicated. But for a lot of people it's just the vulnerability and the letting go of the role that they the way they saw themselves and they, I, I will not be less than who I want to be. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, and, and to your point about pain, you know, the people who took care of me were just, I mean, they're saintly, really. And, um, you know, pain management is such a important part of, I think, any treatment. I mean, I could count on one hand the number of times that a practitioner would come in and the first question would not be, are you having any pain? And you know, what, where is your pain on a, on a scale of one to 10? Right. And it's foremost uh, in treatments. And, and really, I think you're right. Or, you know, I can only speak for myself, but it really, really was managed. But, you know, to be 
in a hospital bed for five months as I was to lose all um, you know muscular ability to not be able to stand all of these things you know is is very strange and disorienting and and you don't feel like you you are I mean it, it's an existential moment because I think that's true I mean there aren't any it doesn't matter in the oncology ward if you're a journalist or a doctor or oh, you no. know what you've achieved we, no, we all we don't care we all share uh, that 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 personhood um, uh, that we become there w w which is very interesting in and of itself but also you know I I am I going to continue to live like this for 10 years or 12 years or 15 years I, I, you know it's a difficult thing to to fathom you know when you were saying about um, that it's it, that death is the great level or, or being in an oncology ward like illness doesn't care who you are we were talking earlier earlier about the AIDS epidemic yes and certainly if that didn't teach us that we don't care if you're famous or you're, you know, you got a million dollars or ten million dollars, it's not going to save you. You're, you could be a street hustler or, you know, a king. Um, and I, I do think um, that one of the the kind of privileges of working at bedside is because is that it. People get down to their essence, and the, a lot of the ego gets stripped away. Sometimes it's humbling, right? You have to drop your roles. It can be infuriating because now you're in a hospital and you're waiting for them to feed you when they feel like they have the time right. or you ring that call bell. I mean, that helplessness. Um, and the system needs support. I always tell people, if you have anyone you love in a hospital, you need to be that. You need an advocate with exactly. you all the time because... Uh, you know, it's still driven by the bottom line, unfortunately, in a lot of ways. Well, and it gets so complicated. Um, you know, and my wife w was just heroic in playing that role and being the advocate. She was there every time there was a doctor and taking notes, trying to explain, you know, helping the two of us trying to figure out and, and asking questions about what exactly is going on. But I know there are so many folks and you know, particularly if you're in a, English is not your first language and there are not translators, you know, what is happening to me? And again, it goes to that sense of control because at least if you understand the processes, the physiological processes that are going on in your body, what they're trying to do to combat it, why they're doing it, um, it just makes it um, easier to you know, continue to put one foot in front of the other, which is basically what it's about, I think, at that point, um, that you ha still have the mental capacity to uh, put a framework uh, and a narrative over what it is that you're going on. I like narratives, obviously, I'm a journalist. But right, right, We right. all have our narratives. We all tell stories to ourselves about ourselves, about what's, what's going on. And the more informed you can be about actual facts when that's going on, I think, the better. Well, it, you know, and it, it, it uh, brings up something else, which is the pre-planning thing, which people have so much resistance to, which is doing an advanced care directive. And California has a law about the physician's order for life-sustaining treatment. So we're talking about long-term illnesses. But what if I'm, I have cancer and then I also have a heart attack and I'm 85 and I'm frail? Like, do I really want them to do CPR when I'm so fragile that CPR will break my rib cage? You know, and people don't, want to do those planning thinking about those kinds of things either and yet um, it's such an important life decision and we can have some some controls at least expressing our wishes but we're still so reluctant yeah to go what there. do you think that's about i mean do you think that's just part of the whole cultural denial of death uh, i do i i do and i've done i, I i'm trained as a you know facilitator of those things and I've talked people through the wishes and all that stuff and it's always like well I'll I'll sign it later and it, it, it to me and and Lord knows with the disasters and the kinds of things that we see every day whether it's a shooting or fires you don't wait you know, to a time that it's convenient. I mean, I in my own experiences with death no, and dying. No, just do it. <laughs> it, it. Right, and you can change it, but it's some somehow it's it's like if I sign this, then I'm inviting death to come in. It's like this almost magic um, 
misconception that by talking about death, I'm inviting it in. That's so interesting. I mean, certainly by doing it, you're acknowledging your death. And, and I do think, you know, I mean, one of the things that was interesting is um, one of the things people ask you after you've had a serious illness or worse, when you're, when you're going through it is, well, what has this taught you? You know, what insight do you have? And, you know, what, and I thought about that a lot, you know, and of course, you know, all of us say, well, I'm going to live more mindfully and more fully every day when this happens. But that goes away pretty pretty quickly, I think, for for a lot of people. And I, and I, w I want to ask you about this because I, Speaking of magical thinking, I really do think that most of us, if not all of us, go around thinking, yeah, everybody's going to die, except me. Oh, yeah. Know, you know, oh, yeah, like, I'm going to be the exception. Oh, no, I think we all have that because to really sit and, and, I mean, I think that's what's so interesting about Buddhists who actually make you contemplate your death in a different way. You know, Buddhist monks have these practices. It's the impermanence. And um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, and I also think it shows up when we're with people that have had a loss, people that are grieving. We, we, we're not good with other people's pain on any level. So your grief makes me uncomfortable. I'm gonna distract you because I don't like being around that. Yes. Your grief from a loss makes me think about my loss and my death and let's just go out for dinner or a movie because that's more comfortable. And that really, makes people who are grieving very isolated, it very does. isolated. You know, I have a, um, a younger person in my family, a niece of mine, who lost um, her son in a skiing accident suddenly. He's 21, 21 years old and um, her only child. I mean, it was, it was the whole, her whole life and, um, you know, going through that with her and it's about a year ago, and over the last year, she's taken to social media. It's interesting. She has a special Facebook page, and she puts up pictures of him, and she's very... Jerry, she, we got to stop it. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you so much. You'll have to come back. Um, thank you for um, watching TVSB. Thank you, TVSB, for allowing us to do this show. I want to thank my guest, Jerry Roberts, and my crew, Elliot Jacobson and Michael Nicholson. We have a book of living love and you might want to put the name of someone you want to remember in this book. And Jerry, thank you so much. Thank you we'll for having me. We'll have to have me. you back. It was a pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thanks.